Let's go to God in prayer before we open up our text this morning. Father, we thank you so much for this day. Uh, We thank you for times that we have to share together. We thank you for your word and the way you have revealed yourself through it. We thank you for the privilege and the opportunity to gather as your children. Pray that we would be still for a moment, that we would be still before your spirit, that we would be available to you, that our minds would be clear, that our eyes would be open, that our hearts would be soft, so that you can do the work that you need to do within us. And we pray that as we leave this place, we'll not put aside the things that we've talked about, the things that we have thought about, the things that we've been convicted of. But instead, we will leave here seeking out the ways in which your Spirit leads us each day. That we will seek out opportunities to be light in a world of darkness. That we will seek out those chances that we have to share and to testify to the saving grace of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We ask these things in his name. Amen. Well, we began uh, last week... um, uh, a series, and I mentioned to you before, in case you weren't here, I'll kind of reset that for you. It's called Binge Reading the Bible. Um, and over the course of this year, we're going to read through the Bible chronologically. Um, if you want to be a part of that reading plan, you can find it in U version. You can look in the front of the bulletin and you can see about how you can get text message alerts every day with a link uh, to the beginning of our reading for the day. Throughout the year, as we come to a new part of scripture, uh, we'll talk about how to read those kinds of scripture. Last, last week we looked at how to read books of the law, the Pentateuch. Um, it's a very different kind of reading <clears throat> than much of the rest of the Bible. Uh, and because it's a different genre of, of writing, we have to know how to read that. What, what are we looking for in it? How does God work through the words of the law that we are reading that was written not to us, uh, but to a Hebrew people? that were here thousands of years ago in a different time, in a different culture, with a different expectation. So the question becomes, why in the world are books like Leviticus and Deuteronomy and Numbers relevant to the church today? Um, We talked last week about how God reveals himself even in those kinds of things, Um, and so therefore we have a reason why it is preserved. Now this morning we're going to look at the book's of wisdom. Uh, we started this past week in our reading. We've, uh, if you've been following along, you've probably made it almost all the way through the book of Job. Job is a book of wisdom. There's five books of wisdom. Uh, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon. Uh, they're known as poetic literature, and they highlight these spiritual and practical insights of God's people really throughout history. Uh, We find prayers, we find songs, we find poems, um, and we find proverbs. These little snippets of wisdom that come um, that are generally true. They are not uh, firm truths, you know, for, you know, that you can kind of bank on all the time. But generally speaking, uh, they're, they're truths that provide us some avenue through which we can live and live in a way that is wise. And each one of these books highlights a different aspect of the wisdom of God. Um, As we're reading through the book of Job, what we find is Job, in in its poetic form, tells us about what it looks like to live in a wise and godly way, even in the face of suffering. Here is Job, who has lived a right and righteous life and is facing some suffering that he doesn't believe is right, he doesn't believe is is fair. And we see him uh, speaking to God in very bold ways, saying, this is not right of you to do this to me. We see how Job deals and copes with suffering, even in his disagreement with God. We see him do it in a way that is wise and pleasing to God, because when he does receive a response from God, Job's response is in line with the will of God. Proverbs, we have these pieces of wisdom and perspective for for day-to-day living. Things that we can kind of take heart each day as we go about. In in Psalms, there are 
look, if you're ever in a place where you need a prayer and you don't know what to say, you can find it in Psalms. There's psalms of praise, there's psalms when David is high, there's psalms where he is in a pit, there's psalms of of repentance, there's psalms of confession. Uh, There is a psalm for anything you are dealing with in your life, and and it is simply a way through the words of the psalms to open yourself up and, and to really pray in a different way, because the psalms are songs, and, and many of them are prayers to God, uh, if not all of them. So we find different avenues in there. Song of Solomon is a, is a beautiful poem uh, from a man to his wife. We find truths about, about wise living and wise relationships and a wise uh, relationship between a husband and a wife in the Song of Solomon. Ecclesiastes is is the woes of a king who was more wise than anyone who ever lived. And as he looked back on his life, he is going through and, and looking at things that he wished he would have done differently. He points out some things that he did well. So there's all kinds of wisdom, and a different aspect of wisdom, of God's wisdom, flows through each one of these very unique books. But because they are wisdom literature, we have to read them differently. And here's the thing that we kind of come to, especially with wisdom literature, and that is this, that God reveals himself, reveals his wisdom to humanity through a variety of creative forms so we can make decisions in a way uh, that pleases him. Last week we looked at how God revealed himself through the book of, books of law, how he revealed himself through the law that he gave the Hebrews, how he revealed himself in creation and even in the preservation of Noah and in, in the flood. We see God's character and his nature revealed in the way that he says, this is how you are to live in relationship with me. And in wisdom, we see a different kind of revelation of God. We see a revelation of his wisdom, a revelation of his spirit, a revelation of his knowledge, a revelation of how he relates to his people in a very real and creative way. There are some very specific ways Different sections in this, this way teach on how to attain wisdom. For instance, Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And look, I have watched enough police dramas and TV shows to know that if you haven't done anything wrong, there's no reason to be afraid. I mean, they tell them that all the time in their interrogation. And so we come to passages like this that say the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And I think, what do I have to fear if I haven't done anything wrong? I shouldn't be in fear when I come before God, but maybe we've kind of misunderstood fear. Um, I, I didn't fear my father unless I had done something wrong. I didn't fear my mother unless I had done something wrong. And then sometimes mom would say, what are you doing? And I'd be like, what? what? What are you talking about? I'm not doing anything. What do you mean? It's like, hey, chill, I'm just asking, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, I'm making a sandwich. <laughs> right? But sometimes there's this guilt that resides in us because we've done something wrong that we, we have this idea that everyone's out to get us. Maybe sometimes we see the fear of the Lord as kind of being that same way, in the same way that we fear people um, in authority even in our everyday life. Look, I'm going to tell you, when a policeman gets behind me on the highway or on a road, I tense up. I don't know why. I'm, I'm not going over the speed limit. I haven't done anything wrong. I'm using my turn signals for once to make lane changes, especially if I see him behind me. I'm being very particular about the way that I drive, but somehow I'm like white knuckling it. I'm like, can I just slow down so you'll pass me? Because we get a little bit tense, but that's not what it means to fear the Lord. He's talking about a different kind of fear. He's talking about a kind of reverence, a kind of awe, a a kind of idea that says, is it real that I'm allowed to be in the presence of the one who created everything? Of the almighty God that he has invited me here to walk along with him. And maybe in our understanding of everyday Christianity, we've kind of lost what it means to live in fear of God. 
because we've created in our minds a God that is more of a buddy than he is a king, who's more of a pal than he is the almighty Lord of hosts, who's more of a daddy than he is a father. And while certainly there are aspects of God that are very near, that are very touching, that are very intimate, He is still the King. And it doesn't matter how close our relationship is, He is still the ruler. He is still the Lord. We have proclaimed Him as such. He has created us as such. And maybe we've lost a little bit about what it means to live in reverence in complete awe of a Creator who would invite us into His life, into His being, into His existence. One of the most important traits that we can have in seeking the wisdom of God is the fear of the Lord. To properly understand really and truly how great is the Lord of hosts. Because when we fear God, we understand His capabilities. But maybe when it comes to summarizing these five books, it may be Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, is really the best way to go. The best way to really summarize what it is to live in this way. To lean in to God. To lean in to God is the only way of life in which we can endure times of trial and tribulation. It's a phrase that has kind of become popular lately. You know, to lean in. Dylan, I told you I was going to have you come up here and help me. So come up here for a minute. What does it mean to, to lean in to something, to, to lean on something? You know, I, I think of leaning on something like sometimes if, you know, I'm not feeling very good, I guess I've got to lean on something. Maybe you've got to lean on something to help, help us walk at times. I've had to use crutches. Um, yeah, thank you. I would have been looking for that in a minute. But when we lean on something, I'm not going to lean on you yet, okay? Oh, no, he said. I want you to stand straight up. And if you put your hands out against mine, you stand straight up, I can pretty easily push you back. But the thing is, it's not just about force, because I don't know if you know this or not, but I'm a little bigger than he is. But if I'm standing straight up, he can pretty easily push me back as well. But it doesn't take much but a little bit of a lean to lean in. And that force becomes a little harder for me to push through. Because he's, when you lean into something, it's not that you get closer. But you're using the force of something else to help resist what is there. That's all. Nothing embarrassing today. I'll save that for next time. What does it mean to lean in to suffering? I mean, are we really asked to lean into the presence of pain in our lives? How else do we resist the force that is there? I mean, read stories like Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, and Daniel in the lion's den, and all of the suffering that Paul and Silas and Barnabas endured. You know, they didn't resist those things. They leaned into them. And what happens and what we see happening is that in the presence of suffering, it's not that God is absent. It's that sometimes God saves you from those trials, from those places of pain and suffering, but sometimes it is in the midst of those things that we find God. That God is sometimes most powerfully present in the middle of our pain, in the middle of our trials, in the middle of our tribulations. To lean into those things, to lean into those times, to lean into God, and to lean on God when we realize that there's really no other way in which we can make sense of what is to come. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart, and do not rely on your own understanding. I have been told all of my life, 
by people not called mom and dad. There's only one person in this world you can trust. Don't trust anybody but yourself. You want to get anything done right? Do it yourself. you got to look out for number one. Look, it doesn't matter what happens as long as you're happy. Hey, you got to be you. You've got to live your truth. That's not true for me, but if that's true for you, that's fine. You can do whatever you want as long as it doesn't affect my rights and my privileges. You don't need help. You need to be independent. You don't need to be able to you, don't need to, you don't need to rely on anybody for anything because you can do it. It's the American way. It's the, it's the hum, human way. We don't like those things, to, to be dependent on other people. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and do not rely on your own understanding. Think about Him in all of your ways and He will guide you on the right paths. To depend on God. It's not natural to depend on something or someone. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not rely on your own understanding. Think about Him in all of your ways. And he will guide you in the right paths. This is the heart of the wisdom literature. It's the heart of the Psalms. It's the heart of the Proverbs. It's the heart of Job. Job's going through all kinds of things. And the only thing he knows is that here is God. And this is not the way it's supposed to be. But he goes to God and he says, why are you doing this? This isn't right. This isn't fair. I've done everything you asked me to do. I've lived the way I'm supposed to live. And this is how I am repaid. And when he receives an answer from God, he looks at God and he says, my Lord and my God, I shouldn't have doubted you. Yes, you are enough for me. Because that is really the question that comes back to Job. When Job says, why are you doing this to me? He never gets an answer from God. God never says, here's why. Well, this happened and this happened and this happened. And this is why you are where you are. Where you are. He says, do you not know who I am? I am the Lord your God. Am I not enough for you? Because you may have lost your family, you may have lost your home, you may have lost your property, you may have lost your cattle, you may have lost everything, you may have lost your health, but you have not yet been forsaken by your God. Is it enough for you if everything else is gone, if it is only you and I that stand? That is the question that Job is left to answer to God. Do you not trust in the wisdom of a God who created all of these things that you are mourning the loss of? And Job's answer to God is, yes, you are enough. And Job is restored. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. If you're trusting in something else for your comfort, for your peace, for your fulfillment, it's not the way God's people are called to live. And sometimes we have to jump when we don't know what's on the other side. All right, we have to learn how to trust in something that we can't always see. I can remember trying to get my kids out of some predicaments that they've been in, either in tree houses or trees or, or other high places, and I'm sitting here just saying, you're going to have to jump because I can't come up and carry you down. And they're like, mm, I don't think so. And they can see me, right? Now imagine if I was the invisible man saying, no, jump, you're going to be fine. And they're like, I'm really not trusting you now because all I see is the ground. God told Abraham, just go. I'll tell you when you've gone far enough. I'll tell you when it's time to stop. Pack up your stuff, pack up your family, and start walking, and I'll tell you when we get there. It's a tough call. That's a tough challenge. But Abraham followed. It's difficult. 
it's a difficult thing to think about. I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if that would have gone over real well if I would have come home one day and said, "Hey, Heather, guess what? I quit my job and we're moving. I rented a U-Haul. They're going to be here to pack it all up tomorrow, and we're going to start driving. And I'll know when we get there." Thankfully, <laughs> I've never received that call. Um, now, they have been a little bit ambiguous at times. But, you know, there are times where God says, look, do you trust me to just do what I'm asking you to do? And you'll see what happens when you get there. You'll see what happens when you make that decision. We'll see what, you will see what happens when you step out in faith. I promise you I will not let you down. But there are times where that landing is blind and it's like, man, I hope this is the voice of God that's calling me to do this. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. Verse 5, the very first part of this, proclaims the heart behind any wise decision that you can make if you trust God in all that you have, with all that you have. To trust Him with everything. Our day-to-day experiences in life are generally tied to our ability to make decisions and assess the consequences, but sometimes we're not asked to do that. We're asked to just simply follow to just simply respond to a call. Sometimes I think we expect God to direct our paths even though we've not spent any time trying to communicate with Him. Though You know, we can talk about trust and we can talk about reliance and we can talk about dependence. But how do we expect God to lead and to guide if we are not going to first spend time in communication? That part of knowing, part of trusting, part of depending, part of relying is to have that flow of knowledge. Through His Word, through prayer. Verse 6 of Proverbs chapter 3, you know, he says that, when we acknowledge the Lord in all of our ways, then He will direct our paths. And I acknowledge the Lord in almost all of my ways. And I think that's frequently the problem. Is we acknowledge the Lord in almost all of our ways. But there are generally those few things that we are just so hesitant and so reluctant to relinquish. Because we hold them too dear or because we're afraid to turn them loose. In order to get to know the Lord in our process of living, we should observe His statutes and continually be in prayer. And as we do so, He will direct our paths. But to live a life of constant prayer, to be constantly before the presence of God, to trust in Him with all of our hearts and to lean not in our own understanding. And to never be so proud or think we, that we are so self-dependent that we resist asking for help along life's journey. And then I find myself here so frequently. I can do it. It's not that I don't want your help. It's that I don't need your help. I don't need your assistance. I am self-dependent. I can take care of my own mess. I can take care of my own glory. I can take care of my own family. I can take care of my own life. I don't need you and I don't want to need you. Because to be in a place of need is to be in a place of vulnerability. And we don't like to be vulnerable. We like to do things for ourselves. Hey, you want help with that? No, it's cool, I got it. (laughs) Here, let me carry this dresser in. I don't need help. I'm going to need help tomorrow getting up off the floor when my back's thrown out. But, you know, I'll cross that bridge when I get there. And I'm going to deny your help then, too. We like to be able to do it ourselves. But there is a balance, right? I mean, there is a balance. Because Paul even writes 
you know, that hey, each person should be responsible for his own obligations. And so certainly we're all here to help one another, but we also each have an obligation to take care of the things that are ours. And so we have two extremes. We have the one who refuses help in all situations, and we have one who refuses to take care of themselves and just relies on everybody else to take care of the stuff for them. Like, why would I do it when you can do it for me? <laughs> and neither are healthy, and neither are the way that God has called us to live. But part of the wisdom of God is learning to live in community. And one of the ways we learn to lean onto God and and to learn of God is by leaning into each other, learning from each other, into his community of faith, the community of believers, our brothers and sisters, to not be so proud of our independence that we forget how to be totally dependent on God. The books of wisdom teach us a lot about how to live wisely in life's situations. So as you read through these books of wisdom, remember that. Remember that God is revealing himself in very creative ways about his mind, about his character, about his nature, and about how we as his people live in a way that is wise and that is in line with his wisdom and his character and his nature. Maybe you need to take your place amongst God's people to begin your walk in that way. To begin living by His wisdom and in dependence on Him and His Son for our salvation and for our purpose. If you need to be baptized this morning, begin a walk with Jesus to receive the gift of eternal life and the dwelling of the Holy Spirit within. Or maybe you need help finding your way back to a path you know is right. If there's any way the church can be of assistance to you this morning, you can make it known as we stand.